Hello and a warm welcome. I'm Armin Trost, professor at the Furtwangen University in Germany. And this is my series on human resources strategies, a real master course for advanced HR students, professionals and executives. This series is available on YouTube and on all podcatchers like iTunes or Spotify. All slides that support this series are available on my website. For more information, please read the description to this YouTube or podcast. I'd also like to refer to my book, Human Resources Strategies, available at most online bookstores. So, again, thanks for listening. Have fun and gain valuable insights into the fascinating world of HR strategies. So, this time we talk about base pay. What is base pay? Base pay <laughs> refers to the fixed salaries employees receive on a regular basis, or maybe on a monthly basis. It's negotiated, made be part of the job contract, it's the deal. Yeah. You could also look at base pay like uh, as a kind of flat rate. It's a flat rate. You, you get, you, you receive independent from your actual performance. Okay, so base pay, as I said in the last episode, is pretty much about acquisition and retention. Really, it's, it, base pay is not there to motivate people. It's, it's also not there to make people better. Base pay is the instrument, really, to hire people with the appropriate level of competence so that they can fulfill certain responsibilities. Huh? That's the idea here. Base pay is the thing here for acquisition and retention, right? Base pay might not motivate people, but base pay could demotivate people. That's a, that's a very interesting uh, um, a psychological idea here. Uh, if, if people receive more than the others compared to their contribution to the team's or organizational success, they might not perform better. Right? But if somebody feels that he or she uh, does not earn enough compared to his or her contribution, he or she might reduce uh, his or her uh, motivation uh, or willingness to, to contribute. This is something that we name the sucker effect. <laughs> uh, we know this from, from social sci sci psychology. And when we look at the base pay, and I don't want to go too deep into the fundamentals of base pay and the real fundamentals. I mean, that it's, it's not a, it's a master course here, not a bachelor. And I can, I can refer to uh, two uh, videos that I uh, posted years ago on YouTube. Uh, I know some of you have seen that uh, about, about compensation and benefits. And there I really outlined all the fundamental uh, ideas around base pay and variable pay. I don't want to go too deep into this, but something that is relevant here now is really to understand that individual pay usually depends on the so-called pay grade. Uh, people belong to different pay grades, and the higher the pay grade, the higher is the base pay. Right? That's a fundamental idea. And, and, and the, 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 the level of pay grade goes along with the degree of responsibility. So the more responsibility you have in your job, the higher is your pay grade. Okay? That, that's, that's the idea here. Okay? So, um, how does that work? How does that work in most companies? Uh, in most companies, there is a, a fundamental logic. And I would like to challenge this one here. And I want you to become aware which kind of uh, uh, logic you follow in your organization. Because now that's, th that's really strategic. So let me start with a traditional textbook thinking. And the approach I will share with you now in the next two minutes is something that you find in almost any textbook. So the idea is this. Here is a job, right? Let's say a job of uh, uh, purchase 
expert, okay? Purchase expert. So what, what we do first is we look at the responsibility that goes along with that particular job. And many companies use maybe the Hay system, yeah? Again, when you want to understand the Hay system, go to my uh, video I posted on YouTube earlier, the lecture in 2013, I, I guess. Um, so you look at the level of responsibility based on so-called compensable factors, and then you will get an overall score about the level of responsibility related to this particular job. So, and when you look at all these responsibilities, you come up with a kind of job evaluation. Yeah? And then the job evaluation, that determines the pay grade. The higher uh, the responsibility, the higher is the pay grade. And once the pay grade is defined, let's say pay grade 6, <laughs> pay grade 7, then uh, you post the job and you hire the employee. Right? That's the idea. So you always start with a job. You always start with the evaluation of the job. And once all this is done, then you fi try to find the appropriate person inside the organization or outside the organization. And once an employee is hired for this particular job, the purchase expert, then it's absolutely clear, okay, this is pay grade six, and this is what you're gonna earn. That's, that's the whole story. That's the whole story. But I see a lot of companies, I see a growing amount of companies that follow up on a, on a completely different, not a completely, but yeah, a slightly different approach. And what they do is say, okay, let's start with a job. So that's no difference. Here's a job. Here's a job that we need to fill, okay? So let's look who could do the job. You should start with an employee, not, not, with, a, not with a job. You start with the employee. And you try to find an employee for this job and, and very often you might find not the right person because of talent shortage. Very often it's this, okay, I need a purchase expert. Uh, I need an experienced purchase expert, but I don't get one. So maybe I can hire a, a more junior one and, and, and develop this person into the right level of responsibility and competence. Maybe I can do this. Right? So you, you want to have some flexibility. So you look first, is that employee somebody who has the potential to grow into this responsibility? But in that moment, this person, when being hired, is not capable to, to really demonstrate the, the expected level of responsibility, which is fine in this moment. Because you think, okay, I will develop this person. So let's start with a lower level of responsibility and evaluate the lower level of responsibility and then we determine the pay grade, post hoc, so to speak. You, you define the pay grade once the employee is here and once the employee is evaluated according to his or her capability to take over responsibility. I know some companies don't want to do this for certain reasons. Also very often employee representatives don't want to do this. Uh, this is what some companies name flexible grading. And let me translate this into a strategic statement. The traditional approach goes like this. In the beginning, there is always the job, the associated responsibility, its evaluation and grading. Only then a suitable employee could be hired. Okay, this is what I just explained. And the flexible way goes like this. And here is again the strategic statement. When creating jobs, we are guided by the responsibility that an available employee can assume. This enables us to react flexibly to given labor market conditions. Okay? Oh, that's, uh, that's interesting. That's, that's interesting. Uh, not, not so simple. Okay? So, this is what I said. Yeah? Pay grade depends on responsibility. That's always the case. But how you handle this? How much flexibility you put into this? That's a, that's a, a real strategic question. And then, as, as, as many of you know, uh, uh, most companies use pay structures, you know, where salary bands are defined along with different pay grades. So the higher the pay grade, yeah, the more broader very often are the pay bands. And the pay bands define the, the, the spectrum. Yeah, M minimum wages, highest possible wages within a given pay grade. So these are these pay structures that 
we very often have, right? Um, and um, then you, when you, when you look at pay structures, uh, they very often look like these staircases, just to give you a little bit of a picture. And and now here's another strategic thing that you, that you you might think of, and the idea is here what we name prod banding. Um, some companies really want to differentiate as much as possible here. They would say the more different pay grades we have, the more differentiated we, we, we are here, the better it is. Right? So sometimes companies have 30 different pay grades. Okay? So that gives much room for promotion. People can be promoted very often from one pay grade to the next pay grade. Um, and the idea behind this is uh, the more you differentiate, the more you can adjust uh, the salary of the people to their actual level of responsibility. Okay? So that's very granular, so to speak. And we have what we name narrow pay bands. Yeah, and uh, the strategic statement behind this goes like this: We differentiate according to as many or narrow pay grades as possible. This enables us to optimally meet the respective responsibilities of the different jobs. Okay, Th that might be one idea. That might be one idea. Okay, but there are some companies that handle it differently and they would rather subscribe the following strategic statement. They would rather say, we differentiate according to as few broad pay bands as possible. This enables us to be flexible and saves time consuming discussions and conflicts. So instead of having 30 pay grades, maybe you only have six, six pay grades. And that that would be a prod. That would that is something that we name prod banding. We have prod bands. I mean, the consequence is clear. The consequence is that once you are in a pay grade, you might stay there for a long, long, long time. I mean, when when I look at uh, uh, professors, for instance, here in Germany, uh, professors in Germany have four pay grades. Just four, yeah, not twenty. Four. It's very simple. And what's the name of the pay grades? One, two, three, four. <laughs> right? That's it. Yeah? And if you're hired as a professor on one pay grade, you're going to stay on this pay grade for the rest of your life. And, and you know, the interesting thing is, and that's something that we're going to talk about again later on, is uh, once you are in a pay grade, you stop negotiating. You stop thinking about money. You know, look, this is the flat rate. That does not mean that, that your money does not increase. It, it, it increased in a given, very broad pay band. Yeah? But, but, you know, it's, it, you do not expect to be promoted again and again and again. No. Yeah? You stop thinking about money. And that's good in some jobs. In some jobs, it's good when the people do not think about money, especially in those jobs where the people uh, uh, act in a very in, in, in intrinsically motivated um, manner. So this prod banding, yeah, having a few prod pay grades, it's a cool idea. It's a cool idea, yeah. Um, in certain regards, okay. Now here's another idea. Um, very often, when it comes to merit increases, yeah, when it comes to the question of how should we increase salary or should we increase salary or or to what extent uh, should salary be increased um these merit increases are very often based on on past performance and on something that we name the compa ratio the compa ratio oh what is that that sounds weird yeah compa ratio what is the compa ratio a simple idea Right? So let's assume there is a pay band, a salary band that has a minimum and a maximum. Let's say the pay band, now let's put it from the air, uh, ranges from 40,000 euro to 60,000, no, 50,000 euro, that's more realistic. 40,000, that's the minimum 
uh, salary you would get on this pay grade 40,000 and the maximum possible level is 50,000 40 to 50,000 so what's the midpoint the midpoint is 25,000 25,000 right that's the midpoint now let's assume you have exactly uh, not 25 sorry uh, 45 what did I say 40 it ranges from 40,000 to 50,000 okay let's do it again 40,000 to 50,000 so the midpoint is 45,000 so now we got it <laughs> 45,000 now if you exactly earn 45,000 the compa ratio is one uh, it's your actual salary divided by the midpoint of the salary band you have 45,000 divided by 45,000 is one right so if you have a compa ratio of 1.1 1.1 then you are 10 percent higher in your salary than the midpoint of your salary band so the compa ratio tells where you are where you are within the pay band now here's another thing that very often comes into play and that's a practice that you find in many organizations. There is this annual performance review and we were talking about this in an earlier episode. Could be a good idea, could be a bad idea, but very often companies have this. They have this to adjust the people's base pay. Right? So let's assume there is an employee who is evaluated as being outstanding yeah outstanding not only exceed expectation but dramatically exceed expectation and now let's assume this employee is on a lower range of the salary band let's say compa ratio 0.8 then in that case the company might say okay in this case we really have to increase the salary by maybe five percent which in that case might be much but if this person is already uh on the on the maximum side of of, of this of the, of the of the of the salary band maybe compa ratio 1.2 is already far over the midpoint you might say okay you are outstanding but you know we cannot increase too much maybe 1.5 percent <laughs> okay and if you are below expectation or unacceptable then there is no increase at all and if you exceed expectation maybe uh, you exceed expectation, but you are already in the midpoint of the salary band. Maybe you get 2% increase, right? So we look, where are people in this range, yeah, in the salary band, and you look at the performance, and then you adjust the base pay. And the assumption is, because you were you did demonstrate so high level of performance in the past, you also will in the future, because the base pay will not be adjusted in the future that is that is a sustainable long-lasting adjustment right so the assumption that very often is true but sometimes is not is the idea that the best predictor for future behavior and future performance is past behavior and performance so and who does that who does the performance review? The supervisor. Yes, a supervisor. Now, here, all the problems come into play that we were talking about in an earlier episode when we were talking about, uh, about uh, formal judgment, evaluation, and assessment. And I don't want to go too deep into this, but, but that could lead to problems. Managers must act like bosses. They must judge their people, but very often managers don't want to because they want to act like coach or partner. And also this individual, this individual um, performance review that sometimes can really kill teamwork. Uh, so there are a lot of effects that go along with individual performance review. And I don't want to repeat myself. Here you have all the problems um that you usually have so let me summarize again the traditional view on this and when i put this into a strategic statement it goes like this providing incentives is a management function yeah also something like uh, the merit increase is a management function it's something that managers do right 
Higher management bodies therefore decide on the amount of the remuneration, and that's the key part of this strategic statement. It's the executives, executives, the managers, who determine whether you receive a salary, a merit increase or not. And now you might say, yes, sure. I mean, who else? <laughs> who else? That's a, that's, a, that's a manager's job. If this is not the manager's jobs, I mean, what else should a manager do than determining the salary of the people? <laughs> right. hmm. Be careful. Be careful. Huh? There are more companies that you might think of that handle it differently. Yeah. And here is the opposite uh, strategic statement. Maybe you, you, you might rather subscribe this one. And it goes like this. As far as possible, salary decisions, including salary increases and the like, should be placed in the hands of employees. Wow. This avoids hierarchical power structures and resentment. That's an interesting idea, right? Eh? That's an interesting idea. Is that good? I don't know. At least it's an opposite way of looking at things. And there are many companies that are doing this. I must admit, uh, these are more, rather small companies where uh, the, the remuneration is determined by the people themselves. Themselves. Oh, I must say, I, 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 I even have met bigger corporations in the past that do this. Maybe not in all areas, but in some areas. Maybe not in all levels, but on some level. So this is the idea of treating people like adults, saying, I mean, you are, you are grown people. You are grown people. So, hey, here is the money. Share it. Share it. It's, it's like we do it with kids. Yeah, with kids. Yeah. You can, you can give kids a, a big pizza and you have, let's say, five kids and here's the big pizza and you tell the kids just share it share it i mean just do it there, there must be no adult telling okay now i share it and then uh, I, I, I i i define the share for for each kid no let the kids do it maybe maybe you can do the same with employees and managers saying look here's the money uh now you think about who gets what will there be conflicts for sure, absolutely. But sorry, that's life. Are, are conflicts bad? No, no conflicts are good. Conflicts very often, if if handled professionally, and handled on a on a factual basis, not on a personal basis, on a factual basis, then conflicts lead to a high level of intelligence very often. So conflicts are good. Conflicts are necessary. Conflicts are part of life. And not always there must be an executive who acts like a father and mother and solves the conflicts for the not so mature people. Conflicts are okay. So some companies might subscribe this or uh, say, okay, we want to make sure that the employees decide. And, and there, are, there are various ways of doing that. And, and maybe just an idea. Um, and by the way, that's the same idea as it is applied in, in my own university. Yeah, when it comes to merit increase, it's it's never the dean who makes a decision. Never, never, ever. It's an authority above uh, with whom I do not work with. And this authority is elected, right? So the classic way is that here is an employee and the employee depends on the immediate supervisor. And the immediate supervisor determines the salary increase. Right? But the supervisor, him or herself, must follow some overall compensation policies which are strategically defined. Because the supervisor has no influence on the compensation policy. Very often the supervisor has no influence on the overall budget or something like this. The supervisor is just, is just translating uh, some, some superior rules and budgets into real decisions. When it comes to the future salary of an employee, that's the role of the supervisor. So the employee pretty much depends on a supervisor. But I see some companies who do it completely different. The employees, they elect democratically uh, what we could name a compensation committee. It's a committee of elected people. Must not be managers, could be regular employees. A group of, let's say, five people, seven people, 12 people. Right? 
these are selected. And when an employee feels that he or she deserves a salary increase, okay, she can request it, but not towards them, the supervisor. He or she will not ask the supervisor, hey, supervisor, I think I should earn more. Hmm. Okay, come to my office and then we negotiate hard. No, the employee requests a salary increase and send it to the compensation committee. And the committee very often reacts and says, hmm, we want to see some references of other people. Do other people agree that you, you should earn more? And please make sure, and we will track it, that you not only take those references with those people that you, that in particular like you. <laughs> Be careful with the selection of your references. <laughs> We're gonna have a critical look at it. So, and when they sell, and then the compensation committee looks at, okay, hmm, do we really think that this person, this employee, really should earn more or not? So there is no supervisor in between. So the supervisor might also in the future stick to his role or her role being a coach or a partner or enabler and must not deal with salary things. Yeah. That's a, also a cool idea. So yeah, that could go on and on and on, you see. So that was about base pay, right, base pay. And in the next episode, we're going to talk about variable pay or about pay for performance in particular. So many thanks for listening and see you next time.